February 24th, 2022, uh, regular meeting, a business meeting of the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission to order <clears throat> in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The Wildlife Resources Commission's meeting room is closed to the public. This electronic meeting is being streamed live for the public to attend and recorded as a public record. The meeting, the recording of the meeting will be available at www.NorthCarolinaNCWildlife.org uh, for you to uh, listen, members of the public. At this time, I'd like to call on Commissioner J.C. Cole for the Pledge of Allegiance. This time, likewise, I'd like to call on Commissioner Kelly Davis for our invocation. Commissioner Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let us pray. Dear Lord. Every time we gather to meet, we're inspired um, by your natural wonders to do our best jobs as stewards of North Carolina's fisheries and wildlife resources. Thank you for those blessings, for blessing us for those treasures that um, all of us and so many people across North Carolina and beyond care about. Please bless our wonderful staff and their families, our constituents, our volunteers, our agency partners, and especially our service men and women, we pray for peace. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> At this time, I would <clears throat> call on uh, Margot Minkler for a roll call. Good morning, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Monty Krupp. Here. Tommy Pomble. Here. David Doyle. <coughs> John Coley. Here. Wes Seegers. Here. Mark Craig. Here. Tom Berry. Brad Stanback. Here. Jim Ruffin. Ray Clifton. Here. Kelly Davis. Here. Steve Windham. Here. Landon Zimmer. Here. John Stone. Here. Hayden Rogers. Here. John Alexander. Tom Hayslip. Here. J.C. Cole. Here. Mike Alford. Thank you. You have a um, forum. Thank you, Margo. North Carolina General Statute 138A15 mandates that the commission chair shall remind all commissioners of their duty to avoid conflicts of interest and appearances of conflict under this chapter, and that the chair also inquires as to whether there are any known conflicts of interest or appearance of conflict with respect to any matters coming before the commission at this time. It is the duty of each commissioner who is aware of such personal conflict of interest or of an appearance of a conflict to notify the chair of the same. At this time, I'll call for any commissioners to declare a conflict of interest on any matters of business before uh, the commission today. Hearing none, we'll move forward with approval, consideration of approval of December 9th, 2021 uh, minute meetings. Uh, all of those were in your uh, packet previously uh, distributed for your review. At this time, I ask, are there any changes, additions uh, to the to the minutes as presented from December 9th? Hearing none, I'll accept the motion to approve. So moved. Second. Got a motion by Commissioner Hoyle, second by Landon Zimmerman to approve the, the minutes from December 9th meeting. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, likewise, minutes stand approved. At this point, we'll move forward to the financial status report and call on uh, Dr. Singler for your report, please. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for giving me the opportunity to present the wildlife's financial status as of December 31st, uh, 2021. Um, as you see in this exhibit, the total revenue as of December 31st, 2021 about $54,846,310.81 mm -hmm. and total expenditures were $52,739,714.17 mm -hmm. and the fund balance as of December 31st, 2021 was $22,895,666.26. In capital improvement fund, the total revenue was $11,662,447.47 and the total expenditures were $12,516,844.76. And 
and the fund balance as of December 31st, 2021 was $1,452,122.99. In endowment fund, as of December 2021, the fund balance was $172,827,521.03 um, with the allocation of fixed income at 43% and equities in 57%. Um, Mr. Chairman, this concludes the five lives financial status report and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Are there any questions, comments on the financial report? If not, without objection, the report will be. Go ahead, Tommy. The format is dramatically improved, DP. Thank you very much. Sure. Yes, sir. Thank you for the compliment. I appreciate it. <clears throat> Any other comments? If not, without objection, the financial report recorded in the record without objection. Okay, Margo. At this time, we'll move forward with uh, special presentations, and I'll call on Dr. David Cobb and Executive Director Cam Ingram was a presentation the 2021 Thomas Quayle Wildlife Diversity Award presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everybody. Good to see everybody here. Uh, and I appreciate you and uh, the director's invitation to come say a few words uh, about the Thomas Quayle Award. First of all, just a little introduction uh, on the award. Many of you have heard this before, but some, some new commissioners have not. Uh, Thomas Quay, who passed away back in 2012, was a professor over at NC State uh, for 32 years in the zoology department. And after he retired, he devoted most of his time to bird conservation in lots of different ways. Uh, and he, and I'll quote here, he described himself as a full-time volunteer and an unpaid environmental activist. And so this award uh, for which he was the first recipient is named in his honor. It's given each year by, by you, by the Wildlife Commission based on a series of recommendations from uh, individuals, the Non-Game Wildlife Advisory Committee, uh, the, the Habitat Non-Game Endangered Species Committee and the full commission. Uh, and so I'm, I'm pleased to be able to participate in today's uh, recognition. Um, and, and this recognition is for Dwayne Raver, and it's, it's a posthumous recognition uh, for, for the award that uh, is, is very, very much deserving. And I want to point out that this has been a real effort by the entire agency. There's lots of people that have had uh, uh, a hand in making this happen, many of them sitting in this room. Uh, but specifically in terms of the nomination, there were uh, four of us that collaborated, and I want to want to mention them briefly. Uh, Fred Harris, who who many of you remember from his long career here with the agency, uh, John Crutchfield, uh, and Jody Owen. So um, you know, Dwayne Raver was was in his early nineties, um, and he had a full career. He had a full life. Um, but my very first introduction to Dwayne Raver was back in nineteen eighty seven. Uh, from, a, from this book. And back in 87, uh, Chuck Minooch, uh, who was a, a active member of the North Carolina Wildlife Federation at the same time period that my father was, uh, gifted me this book. And when I opened it, I was not only taken aback a bit by the information about all the fish, which I like fish a lot more now than I probably did back in 1987, Christian, but um, I, I was taken aback not only by the fish information, but by the art. And I picked just the pumpkin seed uh, for this particular example, because it's a, it's a common fish. It's one I caught a lot growing up. Uh, but when I first opened this book, I just went, wow, man, look at all the art in this thing. Um, and, and they're all paintings. And they're all paintings that Dwayne Raver did. Uh, and so after that, uh, you know, he had a huge career, both as what I'm going to call a fish guy and an artist. And he combined those things. Um, and many of you who went out to the state fair year after year after year, if you went through the village of yesteryear, uh, after his career with the Wildlife Commission was over, he was out there every year painting. And he was always painting different things. And one of the things that everybody who's commented to me over the last couple of weeks has said 
is that he was one of the easiest people to talk to. He never met a stranger. He was friendly to everybody. Uh, and he was somebody that everybody just enjoyed sitting around talking to. And he had talked to you while he was painting. You know, so he, he was very good at that type of multitasking. Um, he's done a lot of art for a lot of people, including our agency. Uh, he's done a lot of art for previous Quay Award winners. Uh, he did a lot of art for uh, retirees from our agency. And so in addition to the artwork that he has done for all kinds of people in the general public, he's been a real contributor even after his official career to our agency and a real philanthropist in that way. You know, he, um, from, from a bit of a, of a personal story, a couple of years ago, I commissioned him to do a, a large scale painting for my son's 30th birthday. And so I ended up going to his house about three times over the duration of him doing this painting. First time we talked on the phone for about an hour and a half and I described what I wanted. He said, all right, I'm gonna draw it out. You come out to the house and look at it. So a week later, I drove out to his house, looked at the artwork, which was great pencil work, but the habitat just wasn't working right. So we talked about it. He said, all right, come back in a week. I came back in a week and he had it perfect came back in a week later and he had it painted. He had it finished. But in that time, I spent a huge amount of time just sitting around talking to him as did a lot of other people through the years. Uh, he touched a lot of people. Um, one, one, uh, one comment that his daughter made uh, the day after he died was uh, she didn't realize how many people she needed to get in touch with, but she had looked at his Rolodex and hopefully every, yeah, everybody in this room knows what a Rolodex is. Um, <laughs> she had looked at his Rolodex and was amazed at how many people she was going to have to let know the news. Uh, and I think that's just one general example of, of, his, of his touch. Um, and he painted until, until the very end, I'll say. And as an example of that, she told me that he actually had a boat paddle he painted a lot of stuff on boat paddles that he had a boat paddle in his studio that he was painting that was unfinished. So he was actually painting all the way up until his health just deteriorated to the point where he couldn't. Um, I do want to mention that I talked to his daughter, Diane, again, yesterday afternoon. She asked that I express the appreciation of the family to everybody, staff, non-game committee, uh, Hengie's full <coughs> commission um, for not only recognizing him and for the, the resolution and the plaque, but also uh, for the Shutterfly book uh, that was put together. And uh, Shannon and Missy and several others uh, took it on themselves to figure out what kind of art do you give an artist? You know, it was always easy when we were trying to recognize people, we could go to Dwayne and he would paint something. But when you try to give art to an artist, it's a little more difficult. And that Shutterfly book, which had a whole series of pictures of his paintings, all of non-game species, was something that, according to his daughter, was really appreciated by the family and really, hit, really, really struck home with his, with his wife. So she asked me to express that appreciation to the commission. And so um, I'll, I'll end with one more comment. Uh, I was in a, a recognition many years ago where uh, the presenter told the recipient, uh, this is not uh, for what you have done, but for what you are expected to do. I'm gonna twist that around just a little bit in this case and say that I think the commission uh, recognizing Dwayne with the Quay Award is both for what he has done and for what he will continue to do through his art because the appreciation and the benefit conservation that he has afforded us and, and, and our state uh, through his art will continue. And I think that's the real recognition uh, for, for Dwayne. And uh, Director Ingram, with that, I'll turn it over to you. 
Thank you, Dr. Cobb. Um, thanks a lot for your thoughts, your personal thoughts and professional thoughts on, on this special day in recognition of, of Dwayne Raver and the Quay Award. Um, you know, when I think of, of where we are today in, in celebrating our 75th year anniversary, I often look back at, at where we've been. And as I look back at where we've been, a name that keeps popping back up in history is Dwayne Raver. And, you know, <clears throat> Where we are today in conservation efforts, you know, practicing conservation and celebrating successes would not be possible without the works of WRC founders like Dwayne Raver. Uh, Dwayne, you know, as as you've read, as you know, started his his career with the Wildlife Commission as a fisheries bi biologist, a federal grant coordinator, uh, a a writer, an artist, and editor, later editor with Wildlife in North Carolina, and had a great career and and set the foundation and the pathway of what we're still doing today in our conservation efforts in North Carolina as Wildlife Commission employees and commissioners. Personally, I wanted to talk a little bit about, as Dr. Cobb has, about, about what it means to me in Dwayne's artwork. Uh, <coughs> as you know, it's, it's artwork to me is, is memories of my outdoor experiences with friends and families, friends and family members, some often in this room right here, those of us that understand the importance of the wild experience and the outdoor experience, understand and appreciate the importance of artwork. You know, when I look at the artwork, as you have described in this book, I, you know, I, I think about where I've been and, 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 you know, the memories that I have myself as a child or with my own children or with my coworkers, you know, enjoying the wild places and enjoying the, the great resources that we have in this state. And, and those memories will last through it forever for most of us here through Dwayne's artwork. So, you know, it's, it's extremely important to me and extremely important to, to the outdoor enthusiast that enjoys his artwork. Uh, now I would like to, to read the resolution of honoring Dwayne Raven, Raver. Res, resolution of North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission honoring Dwayne Raver. Whereas Dwayne Raver is a distinguished North Carolina conservationist and award-winning wildlife art artist and illustrator. And whereas Mr. Raver has provided exemplary leadership for conservation of North Carolina's wildlife heritage for over 60 years by serving as a fisheries biologist, editor of wildlife in North Carolina and through his artwork. And whereas Mr. Raver's paintings of non-game species in North Carolina have brought much needed attention to this important group of fauna that the public would otherwise not likely observe. And whereas Mr. Raver's attention to detail as a fisheries biologist and his personal interest as an illustrator have allowed him to depict each species in a scientifically correct manner, such that they are often used to provide educational opportunities for scientists. And whereas Mr. Raver's artistic efforts have brought to life the rich ecological diversity in North Carolina from darters to warblers mm -hmm from the mountains to the sea. And whereas Mr. Raver has freely donated his artwork to numerous conservation and scientific organizations to help in fundraising, recognitions, and educational efforts, all while promoting wildlife conservation. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission does hereby pay tribute to Dwayne Raver for his outstanding contributions that inspired generations of North Carolinas and advanced the understanding of the state's wildlife diversity. And it further be resolved that the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission expresses its profound gratitude to Dwayne Raver and presents him with the T Thomas L. Quay Wildlife Diversity Award for his exemplary leadership in the enhancement and conservation of North Carolina's non-game wildlife resources. This resolution was introduced by Chairman Monty Crump and unanimously passed by the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission in a meeting duly assembled on February 24th, 2022 in Raleigh, North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will state uh, for the record for the commission, we did try several attempts to uh, deliver this award in person uh, to Mr. Raver and it, it never worked out, but we did try several times. Uh, just the way things turned out, this is 
our celebration today. So I wanted to make you aware we, we did make that attempt numerous times. <clears throat> we'll move forward to committee reports at this time. Now we'll hear the committee reports from Land Acquisition Property Committee. Uh, Brad, stand back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Land Acquisition and Property Committee met virtually out of cycle on February 2nd. The committee re reviewed two phase one and four phase two land acquisition projects. All acquisitions were brought forward later in the meeting for approval and all projects approved. At the end of the meeting, commissioners discussed the warehouser tracks that are adjacent to the Voice of America game land. It was decided to postpone further discussion on these tracks for the time being. The committee would also like to note the Tuckertown recognition luncheon has been postponed until the scheduled land acquisition and property committee meeting on April 13th, 2022. Tuckertown and High Rock acquisitions allowed the commission to retain nearly 5,000 acres that were already enrolled in our game lands program. We look forward to gathering and recognizing all involved conservation partners and staff that were instrumental in the Tuckertown acquisition. That concludes the report. Thank you, Chairman. I'll stand back. Are there any comments, questions regarding this report from other commissioners? We, we will have uh, the four phase two projects will be brought forward later in the meeting today. Thank you. So they'll have action at that time. Any further questions, comment? Here we nine fisheries committee report, uh, John Stone chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The fisheries committee had an out of cycle meeting on February 2nd. Meeting was called to order at 11 o'clock. Uh, Christian Water started out with a personnel update. Staff changes with the recent promotion of Lawrence Dorsey as Piedmont Fisheries Supervisor and Ben Ricks as Special uh, Fisheries Supervisor. Staff then provided a Roanoke River striped bass management update. Chris Smith presented information on the management and status of the Roanoke River striped bass population. Data indicates that the population is overfished and overfishing is currently occurring. The current population lacks older, more reproductively mature fish, specifically females, which produce larger numbers of more viable eggs. The total allowable landing, or TAL, for 2022 would be 6,580 pounds for the Roanoke River recreational fishery based on the lower TAL, with an additional reduction to pay back the harvest overage from 2021. In an effort not to exceed the TAL, committee concurred with the staff's recommendation for a four-day harvest, April 23rd and 24th, and April 28th and 29th for the <clears throat> entire river. Daily krill limit was reduced previously to one fish per day through temporary rulemaking. Communication plan to inform constituents of the Roanoke River striped bass harvest season will be implemented. We then moved on to a discussion of the use of, of the habitat sluice at Mud Creek um, for uh, muskie. Doug Bessler presented background information on the status of muskie in the French Broad River and habitat restoration efforts at Mud Creek. Uh, staff are monitoring the use of the Mud Creek habitat sloughs by muskie through tracking uh, via uh, pit tag <coughs> antenna arrays and use by anglers angler use with trail camera cameras. The committee expressed interest in restricting fishing in the habitat sluice during the spawning season and asked staff to draft a rule proposal for consideration at the next commission meeting. Uh, we then received a North Carolina estuarian striped bass fisheries management plan update. Gary McCargo provided an update on amendment two to the <coughs> North Carolina estuarian striped bass fisheries management plan which the Marine Fisheries Commission will consider releasing for public and advisory committee review at their February meeting. Jeremy also briefly introduced the management strategies that are presented in the plan. Many questions were held uh, until the April meeting when the plan will be discussed further. The committee will have the opportunity to select preferred management options. Meeting adjourned at 12, 18 p.m. And that concludes my report, Mr. Chair. Are there any comments or questions for fisheries report? Obviously, it wasn't the best news in the world about the Roanoke, but I think you did the most responsible thing you could have done. So yeah, we really uh, just didn't have another choice. No choice. Yeah. But I think you handled it appropriately. Any further questions? 
Habitat Non-Game Endangered Species Committee Report, Chairman Craig. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Hindus Committee met yesterday from 9 to 9.50. Mr. Todd Ewig and Dr. Sarah Schweitzer presented proposals to add four fish species, two bat species to the protected animal list, and no change in listing status for one bird species. Staff then presented the proposed technical corrections to the protected animal list. These included changes due to federal status for three species, change of the name for two species, and removing one species due to it no longer being considered native to North Carolina. The Hinges Committee members approved staff's proposed changes and recommended take them to the Rules Committee meeting in April. Mr. Ewing and Dr. Schweitzer then gave a summary of a draft conservation plans for the Atlantic pig toe and Henslow sparrow. The Hinges Committee approved posting these plans for public comment. Last, Ms. Cindy Simpson presented an update on the progress towards revising the Wildlife Action Plan. The plan is currently undergoing a major revision to include plants. Ms. Simpson also explained that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service requires all wildlife action plans to be updated every 10 years. The process for updating the plan has begun and will be completed by 2025. Staff are working with AFWA and SEAWA on an effort to make the plans more consistent among states. That concluded our meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Are there any other comments or questions for Yes, go ahead. Yes, sir. The, the wildlife plan um, has to be updated every 10 years. Correct. By what's the governing body that says that? <clears throat> I'm just I'm just curious. It's, a, it's, it's for the federal funds match. So thank you. Yeah. You got it. Any further questions? For the committee report on habitat, non-game endangered species. Here none. We'll move forward to Roost Committee Report, Chairman uh, Wes Seegers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Rules Committee met yesterday to review out of cycle rule proposals. Staff presented a text for potential changes to the 10B and 10C rules required for the periodic review, along with rule changes required by legislation from the 2021 long session. Out of cycle rules will be presented for notice of text at the April Commission meeting. That question is on Rules Committee report. Here none. We'll go here for education communication committee report. Uh, Chairperson uh, Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The education and communication committee met on Wednesday, February 23rd. Staff presented an update on the work being done with the pathway to relevance wildlife relevancy project. <clears throat> the data collection uh, was completed in December, and staff have begun analyzing the information gathered and provided the committee a brief overview. Staff has identified a working group from the Wildlife Education Division and agency leadership that will meet in March to begin drafting the division's operational plan. The project is on track to be completed by the end of the calendar year. An <laughs> overview of the agency's range program was also presented. This included information on the six ranges managed directly by the commission and the three facilities managed by our partners. Staff gave the future vision for the range program that includes the addition of full-time range officers increasing partnerships to assist with funding, marketing opportunities, and facility improvements that will allow for additional classes and programs driven by data from the division's evaluation projects. The committee was advised of a $10,000 donation from Davidson's Firearms of Greensboro for safety upgrades at R. Wayne Bailey Caswell Range. These funds will be paired with the agency's federal shooting range grants to significantly increase their financial impact. That concludes my report. Are there any questions on the Education Communication Committee report? <clears throat> Comments? Here none, we'll move forward to Big Game Committee report. Chairman David Hull. Big Game Committee met to discuss several topics. Uh, Wildlife Chief Brad Howard presented a review of the history of the elk population in North Carolina and an update on current and future elk management activities. Next, we had an update from our new wildlife health biologist, Sarah Vandenberg, on the status of the CWD surveillance efforts. Staff working closely with our constituents in the Servant Health Cooperator Program exceeded 5,500 CWD samples, which is an all-time high. Wanted to really say thanks to the, all the hard work by our agency staff and cooperators that assisted in this effort. It is truly a phenomenal job this year, and here's to hoping we don't find any positives out of those samples. Next, Mariah Boggs gave us a quick update on the deer research project being conducted north of Durham. The project is well underway and seems to be running smoothly. 
Brad presented the deer bear reported harvest updates and commented on the mandatory bear to submission, which is at 79% statewide and continued increase. And at that, we adjourned. Thank you. Are there any uh, questions or comments for the big game committee report? Hearing none, I'll, I'll do the committee report for the committee of the whole. The committee of the whole met yesterday afternoon at 245 and received a very interesting presentation from Chris Goodrow on the commission's dam prioritization project. Dr. Singler presented options for license fee increases based on statute and the committee approved moving forward with the examination of potential increases using the CPIU uh, for the April meeting. Next, Fairly Malum uh, briefed the committee on the plans uh, to promote the agency's 75th anniversary this year. And finally, the committee reviewed public comments and rule text for safety equipment, as well as inland fisheries, rehabilitations and license fees, wildlife management, and game land rules, which will be considered and voted on later on today in, in, uh, in the meeting. Uh, or do you have any questions from the committee of the whole report? Hearing none, we'll move forward. And at this time, we'll have our agency spotlight entitled Bringing Them Back by Brad Howard, our Wildlife Management Division Chief. <clears throat> Brad. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Um, I think everyone's aware, I'm not sure that we're gonna, our, our spotlights uh, for, for this year will revolve around um, our 75th anniversary and significant accomplishments. Um, we had some discussion about who, who was gonna go first and what we're gonna do and, and so the different ideas. And, and this is the idea that, that the Wildlife Division brought forward was sort of certainly one of the, the biggest accomplishments was the, uh, the recovery of, of our top big three big game species in the state. And I was gonna wait and do this in the fall as we moved into hunting season, but Kyle suggested, no, why would we not do this one right out of the box? And so I think I'm gonna jump in here and, uh, and try to present some, some information that I hope you find interesting and, and, and appreciative. Um, we have a library down in the fourth floor. I don't know if you guys have ever been down there, but I was, I was looking through and in the library, there are all the federal aid reports that date all the way back to actually pre formation of the commission and the federal aid reports are the reports that we give for our Pittman Robinson dollars. And I was, as I was going through that, there, there's, there was a book in there and I was flipping through and there's, there's these pictures in there. And, and I looked at them and, and the, this is a deer hunt. It's a big deal deer hunt on Holly shelter. It's, I don't know if it was the first deer hunt at Holly shelter. I'm not exactly sure, but that's governor Broughton up there with the deer. Apparently he killed the first deer on that deer hunt. It was a big deal. So big that they actually interviewed him on the Raleigh AM radio station down here. And then they, they broadcast it the next week. Uh, they actually broadcast the deer hunt on, on the AM radio station. That's how big of a deal this was. So there were, there were a lot of pictures and I couldn't figure out exactly when this was. I was trying to figure out where, when it was. And as I was flipping through there, finally I figured out the date of this deer hunt. And I want you to take a look at this right here and see the happy and the smiling faces. And there were a bunch of other pictures, but this is the date of this deer hunt. Thursday, December 4th, 1941. Wow. Now, so at least one person said, wow, because they wow. know the significance of that. Really close. Uh, the, the, that following Sunday would have been December the 7th, 1941, and the world would have cha would change forever. They were completely oblivious to that on this deer hunt that, 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 that day. So, uh, But it was a big deal to, to have a deer hunt, and it was so big that they inter interviewed the governor on the radio after he killed the first deer on the deer hunt. But I just... I don't know. I just thought there was something when I saw that date, I said, I have to include that in my presentation because it was just interesting. This is one of the reports I was talking about. This is the 1948-49 report. I couldn't find the 1947. This may have actually been the first report since once the commission was formed. Um, but this is a progress report from the game division to the federal aid and wildlife restoration projects. You know, it was very clear that the commission was formed for a purpose. And if you look at the table of contents of that, you know, there's two things I want you to look at in this table of contents. First, they're talking about things that I still and my staff still stand up here and talk to you guys about today. Habitat management, you know, species conservation. But, but if you notice on here, um, it's, it's a very game species focus. It's very game species oriented. That, that was where the commission was at that time. Managing the game species that we had, which would have been a lot of early successional small game species, but trying to figure out how to recover our big game species. So with that, I wanna jump into the first one and the big one. 
uh, white-tailed deer, well, I'm not gonna say big one because they're all three pretty significant accomplishments, but the white-tailed deer population, um, before restoration, um, by the late 1800s, deer populations were sparse across the Southeast. In fact, you could pretty much say for most of the Southeast, they were extirpated. There were no deer, except in, in pockets across, across the Southeast. North Carolina's remnant populations were over here on the coastal plain and a few spots in the mountains, which will become significant. This is a 1950s map. Uh, which will become significant in a few minutes. But uh, in 1900, it's estimated that there were probably about 10,000 deer in North Carolina in 1900. Think about that. Think about the harvest numbers I presented to you yesterday. There was an estimated 10,000 deer. Um, so our restoration era for deer started way before the formation of the commission. Um, it started as early as 1890s, 1900 with Guilford Pinchot and, and Vanderbilt and those guys over there starting that restoration efforts to try to replenish the deer herd over in what was called the Pisgah Game Preserve in Henderson and Transylvania counties on what would become the first national forest, I believe, established east of the Mississippi. And that's and, and Pinchot was is called, often called the father of, of forestry. He started the cradle of forestry, the forestry school. But he's also working on restoring the deer herds over there. Um, from 28 to about 44, that piece of game preserve was 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 growing deer, and those deer were used to stock much of Western North Carolina, along with Georgia, Ohio, Indiana, and Mississippi. So it was a pretty significant source of deer that happened. At the same time, there was also uh, on the Reynolds estate up in uh, Surrey County, they were also doing the same thing up there. And this is actually a picture from our, our magazine uh, of a deer trap on the, on the Reynolds estate that was used to trap and, uh, and, and move deer. So our deer restoration efforts occurred from about 45 to 87, believe it or not, we were still putting some deer on the landscape all the way up until 1987. Deer populations grow fast in locality, but, but, but it takes them a long time to spread across the landscape just by the nature of the does tend to be homebodies. They don't move out as, as fast. So it took a long time. Here's a map looking at where deer were, were introduced, reintroduced, and the source populations that they came from. I'll just let you look at that. I think, I think it's important. A lot of people talk a lot of times about, oh, we got a lot of deer from here. We got a lot of deer from there. Most of our deer in North Carolina were restocked from North Carolina deer. So you can see that the, the populations that we that we drew from and the places that we stocked deer. I think this was the last one back, back in 87, if I'm not mistaken. I think we put deer out in Dare County was, was one of the last ones. So what have our deer populations done? Well, in 1900, I told you there were about 10,000. By, by 1970, there were a little bit less than 400,000. By 84, when we, when we started doing some of the population reconstruction modeling and stuff, we were somewhere at 670,000 deer. The last time we ran the model, which is about 219, uh, we're at 1.1 1, 1 .1 million deer estimated in the state of North Carolina. So um, from 1900 to 2019, we're up over a million deer. Now that's a pretty good conservation success story. Um, this is what, it's, we got so many deer now, we don't have those little maps to show us where the deer are. We have densities by county. Um, and, and interestingly enough, uh, remember back in the day that the, the deer populations were here and little segments here. Now, as the population has been restored and the deer have occupied what, what actually is probably better white-tailed deer habitat through the Piedmont, you see our highest deer densities are in the Piedmont and foothills of the state. What is the impact of that restoration effort? Well, it's estimated that um, during the time of that 1950 to 1970s, in, in 1950 to 70 dollars, we probably spent somewhere around 1.2 million. I don't know what that converts to today exactly, but I do know this. Today in North Carolina, hunters spend approximately $311 million every year on deer hunting related expenses. So I think it was a, a, an investment well, well made. And white-tailed deer are, of course, the most hunted game species in the state. So I, I, think, I think it was a good investment. So success story number one by the, by the commission. Now let's move to, to the next of the big three game species, big game species, turkeys. This is what the turkey population looked like in 1948. Uh, this is the distribution. I don't know what the, in 48, I'm not sure what the population was, but I thought this was interesting in this big, big group here, right here in the Piedmont in, uh, in, um, in this area, 
And I thought that was kind of strange, but you see it up along the Roanoke and some scattered places in the mountains, but that's it. That's where we had turkeys in 1948. Um, we, we really didn't jump into turkey restoration until starting uh, you know, a little bit later. We got, we got a little bit later start than some of the other Southeastern states. Um, in 1970, the turkey population was estimated at 2000 turkeys. 2,000 turkeys in 1970. Well, I'll, I'll zone in on that on that date in, in, in a minute to let you know how that applies to me. But so about that time, we closed the fall hunting seasons, which was actually a big deal. Turkey hunting was fall hunting. We, you know, we think only about spring hunting now, but at that point in time, you turkey hunted in the fall. So closing the fall turkey season was a big deal. Uh, we closed the fall turkey season. We, we moved to a more conservative spring hunting season. And then we begin our trapping and relocation. The advent of the rocket net, we tried a lot of different things through the years. They tried game farm birds. They tried all, all different kinds of things. But really the advent of the rocket net was the, the, the thing that sort of started the recovery of the turkey. So in, in our trapping and relocation efforts by staff uh, with the commission, we, we trapped and relocated six, over 6,000 birds to 358 restoration sites. And this is what those restoration sites look like from 1950 through, through present day. And you see the evolution of that. We did seven sites in the, in the, from 50 to 69, uh, 19 sites through the 70s. Um, into the 80s, we were at 50 sites, the yellow stars, you see where we're going. And then from 1990 on, that's when we really kicked in. And that's when we started moving and relocating to 276 different sites where we put birds across the landscape. I should stop and, and I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the partnership with the National Wild Turkey Federation in this effort. Um, they were very instrumental in assisting the commission and the state in, in, in this effort. So, so, you know, they, as they were across the country in terms of turkey population recovery. So back again to the distribution maps. Here's what it looked like in 75, strangely, interestingly enough, 48, this, this population has started to diminish here. There's not many birds growing a little bit over here in the mountains starting to get some, some restored populations by 1975. And, and then in 95, you see the, the state starting to fill in. And then of course, now we got enough turkeys that now we just track the turkeys by density per county. They're all, they're in every county in the state. And that's the turkey, that's the, the 2020 turkeys per square mile density. And I think we're all familiar with our increase in the spring harvest. The last two years, we've seen the big, huge increase. We'll see how that plays out in the next couple of years to see if that, if that harvest starts to balance out with the, with the long-term average harvest. But our harvest of turkeys continues to increase across the state. So I'm gonna tell, I, I, I told you I was going to tell you how 1970 related to me. So in 1970, remember I said there were an estimated 2,000 birds. 1970 was the year I was born. So literally in my lifetime, we've gone from 2,000 birds in North Carolina to an estimated 270,000 turkeys. So I would say, again, another commission-driven conservation success story. Our third one, and, and, and may, maybe, maybe the biggest one of all, I don't, I don't know, everybody can vote. Colleen will say this is the biggest one of all, I don't know. Uh, the black bear population. Before restoration, by the 1950s, our black bears were extirpated from the Piedmont completely. There were no bears in the Piedmont at all. Um, there were simply remnant populations in the coast and the mountains. This is, this is what the uh, 1971 occupied range looked like. Um, the, the, you know, we had population of bears in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and, and some of the, you know, thick pines and pecosians of the coast and the, and the national forest in, in, in the mountains. It, it was so bad that in 75, they proposed to list the black bear as a species of special concern. That's how few bears we had in the state. Um, in the early 70s, we, we, we started our bear restoration efforts, and, and, and it was really a, a, a multi uh, prong approach to it. The first thing we had to do was get some regulations in place. We had, we had crazy bear regulations. We had different county seasons. It was just completely unchecked. It was all over the place. Commission took, took the reins, put the regulations in place to, to slow this bear harvest and, and protect our bear populations. We started collecting data because believe it or not, we didn't, um, we didn't know a lot of the things we take for granted today. So we started a lot of different data collection efforts. And then, you know, you have to give kudos to our law enforcement staff who took those regulations and really, really started enforcing this, what was kind of unregulated bear hunting up until then. 
And so we put those three things into motion to, 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 to stop the, 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 the harvest rates as they were, and then to, to slow the uh, illegal harvest and those kind of things down. And then as we moved through, we had to do a couple other things. First off, research. Like I said, we didn't, a lot of stuff we take for granted that we know about the bears today in, in as early as the seventies, we didn't know, we didn't know reproductive rates. We didn't know habitat use. We didn't know these things. So um, we've had, we, we, we collaborated with Tennessee and Georgia in one of the first sort of multi-state tri-state bear studies. Uh, that was something that wasn't really going on in those times. And we all got together and said, hey, this is one big bear population in the mountains. Let's study them. Um, I, the, you know, we've done more than two dozen research projects in the state. Not, not us specifically. There have been more than two dozen research projects done in the state of North Carolina over the last three, three decades that have contributed significantly to the understanding of black bear populations. And as we mentioned yesterday, uh, Commissioner Fommel, we, you talked about the sanctuary establishment. That was probably one of the um, most critical things that happened with, with the recovery of our bear population. And, the, and John Collins, our bear bi biologist at that time, you know, came up with the idea, working with other biologists as well, with establishing these sanctuaries where we would protect a core uh, group of, of female bears across the landscape to allow them to reproduce and put and put bears out into the landscape. Um, to say that has been a success is an understatement. Our bear populations are booming, especially in the mountains and in the coast. Um, and to the point that we have the discussions we have about opening up harvest opportunities and those kind of things. So, uh, but it was a novel idea. They had to convince the bear hunters to buy into this. They had, they literally took lands away from them and said, you can't hunt those anymore. These were public lands. And, uh, and, and they of course contributed to the effort and bought into that. And, and we certainly recovered our black bear population. Um, also should probably mention that the fact that, you know, re reforestation efforts in the mountains certainly helped with that as well. You know, in, in the early part of the century, that's what the mountains of North Carolina looked like. Um, you know, they were completely cut to the dirt. And so over time, while some of our forests over there in the West don't necessarily make very good deer or grouse habitat, they still make pretty good bear habitat. So uh, the bears are occupying those reforested areas. Uh, the, our last bear range map was 2010. We're, we're, we're scheduled to update one soon. This is, this is now the occupied range. This down here shows you the 71 occupied range. Now there's where we are in, uh, in 2010. And I can say now that this whole area is filled in. All this area is filled in. The bears are definitely moved. This area is, is bigger and comes down through here now. So occupied range is definitely expanding across the state. There's, you know, our bear harvest estimated population and, and harvest trends that you guys see annually. And we know we continue to increase from that. So where are we with our population estimates? We're, we're now at 7,000 plus bears for sure in the mountains, probably approaching 8,000. And if we continue this 6% growth rate, we'll be hitting 9,000 bears in the mountains in, in the very near future. Um, and we want to try to slow that down. Um, coastal bear management unit, we're at, at least 9,500 plus bears. We want to do this population estimate that we talked about in, in, in upcoming years to get a little zone in on that a little bit better. But that puts us at about 16,000 plus black bears in the state of North Carolina uh, currently. So I think that's the third significant conservation effort of the commission. And as you know, with our bears now, we are a destination place. We have the largest black bears in North America. Um, we're a destination place, not just for hunting bears, but for viewing bears. Uh, lots of people go to the mountains in North Carolina, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, those areas to, to go and watch bears. We certainly know how many people go to the coast to, to take pictures and observe and watch bears. And we certainly know our rich bear hunting tradition, both in the mountains and in the coast. So it's, it's really, really another awesome conservation success story. Uh, I'm going to mention just real quickly a couple notable other species. I, I was going to do a whole speech. It would have taken an hour to commission. The chairman would have killed me. So, uh, so I wanted, I mean, there's so many that we could talk about, but there's otters. We recovered otters. There's wood ducks. We recovered wood ducks. Along with the wood ducks, we, re we restored beaver populations, which led to the recovery of the wood duck. Uh, raccoons, believe it or not, in, in the early part of the career, David Cobb can maybe even remember, I mean, we were still stocking raccoons in the mountains. 
Um, raccoons are fully recovered, mind you, in case you were wondering. Uh, bobcats as well, uh, another species that are, that are doing well. So there's, there's so many that we can check the box on of what we've done in the last 75 years. And, uh, and so I think, I think it's awesome. I think you can look at the pictures. This is the deer hunt at Holly Shelter and all the small, smiling faces. This is a, an early bear hunt getting ready to go um, and, and our turkeys and deer. So I think, uh, I think we can really be uh, proud of the accomplishments of the commission. Um, I think uh, the challenges certainly remain ahead of us in managing these now abundant species and how we do that with our ever abundant human populations. But I would certainly say this is a, a good jump off for you know, 75 years of conservation success. Commission have any comments or questions? Uh, Steve Wyndham. Brad, that was absolutely outstanding. Well done. That is, <laughs> we, we, we really need to get that out to the public. That's just phenomenal. It gave me goosebumps. Awesome. Really a good job. Thank you, sir. It was an easy topic to talk about. Yeah, it was. It's, it's always good when you talk about good stuff. That's right. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Any further comments, questions? I just wish we could see a repeat of this of some other agencies in the state and we'd <laughs> a lot more <laughs> Let me go. Agree. <laughs> I'll move on. Are we have to get copies of this? Yes. I was taking pictures as we went yeah. along, Brandon. Is there a way for us to get copies in, of some manner of this? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we got it. It's right there. We'll it up. That's awesome. Uh, that was awesome. To, if we'll get that out to you again. Good report. Uh, moving on with the agenda, I'll call on Assistant Chief Land Acquisition Manager Ben Solomon this time to present land acquisition property manners on looks like four phase three land acquisitions. And again, I'd remind Commission, please let me state uh, what I need, what we need a motion for in a second, and, and I'll outline the exhibits to get a person uh, second uh, a motion in a second so that Margot can get it properly recorded and we're not having to figure it out after the meeting. So at this time, uh, Ben, we're shut. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, commissioners. Hope y'all are doing well today. Uh, we have four phase two land acquisitions to present to you this morning. I'll be doing quite a bit of skipping around, but I'll try to get you to the probably the most useful part of the exhibit, the map. Uh, the first exhibit is, is exhibit C1, which is the Pisgah Creek track. Uh, the total is 488 acres in Haywood <clears throat> County. Second exhibit is exhibit C2. And this is the Chawan Swamp Game Land Edition. These were donations from Coastal Land Trust, totaling 1,172 acres. Exhibit C3, jump right past it, is the Cape Fear DV tract, which is 296 acres in Pender County. And the fourth exhibit is exhibit C4, which is the Donnie Snelson track, which totals 72 acres in Madison County. Staff and the Land Acquisition and Property Committee recommend phase two approval to proceed with the acquisition of exhibit C1, C2, C3, and C4. I'll entertain a motion and a second for approval of exhibit C1, C2, C3, and C4. Move, move. we. Accept all of those, all four. Got a motion for commissioner okay. stand back, a second by who? Steve. Steve Wyndham. Is there any further comment, question, discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the approval, adoption of C1, C2, C3, and C4, C5, saying aye. Uh, aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. <clears throat> And we'll move forward uh, with our rulemaking uh, portion of the agenda to, and I'll call on Major uh, Ben Meyer at this time, provide rulemaking adoptions for safety equipment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll just direct you to <clears throat> exhibit D1. This is for a proposed amendment to remove the, the personal flotation device type code from state laws, regulation, and rules to be in compliance and alignment with U.S. Coast Guard Code of Federal Regulations. There was one 
comment from the uh, public hearing on, in December. Staff recommends adoption. This time I'd entertain a motion and a second for approval of exhibit, exhibit D. Motion. By a motion from uh, Commissioner Seeger, second, second by David Hall. Any further comment, discussion? Hear none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank Moving you. forward with the agenda, I'll now call on Brad Howard, Wildlife Management Division Chief, mm -hmm. present rulemaking adoption for the 2022 23 Wildlife Management Rules exhibits E. E to to be. Brad. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, exhibit E1 are the public comments that we uh, discussed and talked about uh, yesterday in the community, the whole meeting. At your pleasure, I will move to exhibit E to B. E to B is a replacement exhibit from exhibit two that incorporates the amendments we discussed yesterday in the committee of the whole meeting for rule proposal H2 and H3. There were no other suggested amendments other than those and staff recommends adoption of, of these rules as amended in exhibit E to B. At this time, I accept a motion a second for approval of exhibits E1, E, and e 2B. I move. I motion David Hall. Mm -hmm. Second by Landon Zimmer. All those in fact, is there any further discussion? I want to know about the season limits on the reptiles. Am I missing that on the turtle? The <laughs> Uh, the, ahead, season, the season limits remain at 10 and 100. There's no, there was no change from the previous, uh, the, the current rule that's that, in place. Can we break that one out of the three? Yes, sir. Which, what number is that, Brad? On the snapping turtle. That would be H3. H, uh, we haven't got there yet. Okay. Have we? Yes. Yeah, I, 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 I did them all. I, okay. So, so what's the specific question, Commissioner Wyndham? I want a season. I wanted a season on the snapping turtle. And you're saying it's year round. We talked about it yesterday. Yeah, it's currently year round in rule. We were going to propose a, 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 a structured season, but after conversations and 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 with discussion with the change in the size limit, we feel like that'll give the females enough protection. So we decided not to impose a defined time period and keep it the way it currently is. We have so a that, motion. That's how the rule rule is proposed now. We have a motion on the floor to uh, adopt the rules as presented. Is there any further discussion? Hear none. All those in favor, aye. signify saying aye. Uh -huh. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Moving forward to uh, Inland Fisheries, I'll call on Christian Waters, Inland Fisheries Division Chief, present rulemaking adoption 22 23 Inland Fisheries Rules, exhibits F1, F2. Christian. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, exhibit F1, uh, as presented yesterday in the Committee of the Whole, summarizes the public comments received on six uh, proposed rule changes for fisheries. I'll move on to the voting exhibit, Exhibit F2. Uh, exhibit F2 contains the proposed final rule text. <clears throat> Staff recommends adoption of the proposed rule changes as presented in F2. I'll entertain a motion a second to adopt exhibit F2, F2 as presented. I'll make that motion. I had a motion from Commissioner Stone. Is there a second? Second. I had a second from Commissioner Rogers. Got a motion and a second to approve exhibit F2 is presented. Is there any further comments or questions? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. <laughs> we move forward to the next item on the agenda, Deputy Directors of Operations, uh, Brian McCray to present rulemaking adoption 22-23 land and water access rules, exhibit G through 2B. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Exhibit G1 is a statewide and by district summary of the comments received. This is an informational exhibit and no action is required. I'll move on to exhibit G2B. G2B represents the actual voting exhibit and contains the proposed rule text. G1 through G12 are the proposals that were presented at the public hearing. G13 has been modified in your exhibit based on discussions during the Committee of the Whole yesterday. The change here will modify the name from bear sanctuaries to designated bear management areas to better reflect the purpose of these areas. 
Mr. Chairman, staff recommends adoption of proposal of proposals G1 through G13 as presented in exhibit G2B. At this time, I'll accept a motion to second for approval exhibit G through G2B. So moved. I'll make second. I'll a motion by Commissioner Zimmer, seconded by Commissioner Stanback to approve G2B as presented we with the amendment. Wyndham made the motion. I'm, I'm Wyndham, I'm sorry. I thought, I'm sorry. I don't have a suit on. I'm sorry. <laughs> Are there any other comments or questions? All those in favor, second five, saying aye. 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 Opposed? It's approved. Moving forward now, I'll call on Darren Barnes to present yeah. rulemaking adoption authority on rehabilitation and license fee rules. Oh, yeah. uh, H, exhibit H through 2B. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. So today we're bringing forward to you exhibit H. Uh, and specifically H2B, uh, which is uh, includes incorporates the uh, amendments that we discussed yesterday in the committee as a whole. And at this time, uh, staff recommends approval of the rule proposals as amended in H2B. This time, I accept the motion to second to approve exhibit H2B is presented. I have a motion from Commissioner Davis. Is there a second? Second. I have a commission. A second from Commissioner Wyndham. Any further discussion? All those in favor of adoption of Exhibit H2B signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Exhibit passes. That concludes our rulemaking part of the agenda. And we'll move on at this point. Uh, while I'm making a few comments, uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask Executive Director Cam Ingram to head to the podium. Uh, I will give you a brief update on our over 50 license. Uh, as of today, Janice tells us we've sold $1.4 million, wow. just over $1.4 million of those over 50 licenses. Based on the information that she has and what she told us this morning was as those license sales at this time are not cannibalizing our other annual hunting and fishing license sales. So far, the data does not indicate that. And that what she told us this morning, she certainly can speak for herself if you have any questions, is that uh, We've seen a lot of these people that buy these lifetime licenses that were sporadic buyers of annual license, so which is kind of what we were targeting. So, you know, given the fact that so far we haven't lost annual sales and the sales of this license, you know, is real a value added, you know, to what was what we were hoping to see. And uh, Janice, is there anything you want to add to that? Something I can think of. Okay. But thank you for keeping us informed on that. Okay, uh, at this time, I'm going to turn the program over for a special presentation uh, to Executive Director Cam Ingram. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's, uh, uh, again, a great, great day, great meetings yesterday, um, and I really appreciate all the staff's work that has been involved in, in putting this together and all, of, all the commissioners that have helped uh, move this forward with our great conservation efforts. It's a uh, this is a day to highlight somebody, Eric Christofferson, as, as we've noted yesterday, is going to be retiring uh, Monday, I think it is, officially Monday. Uh, we've been talking about it for ever since I moved up to the director's office level, Eric and I have, and, um, and I just want to say a few things with, uh, about Eric and, and his influence in this agency. I appreciate his family being here, his daughters and his wife are here to, to join us today to celebrate Eric. Um, and I'll keep it brief. Eric would ask that I keep it brief. Uh, and, and, and Eric wouldn't want this uh, as, as far as to highlight Eric. But uh, just to say a few things, uh, you know, as, as most of you know, you've had involvement with Eric over the years. And, and you know, with Eric uh, throughout his career, his duties have, have, have changed. They've grown within this agency and his influence across the state. Um, he's, he's just had a tremendous, tremendous career. He's currently, uh, I keep adding to his duties, but uh, currently he's, you know, he's in charge of our agency infrastructure, which is incredible across the state. Uh, he's in charge of our finance department, which is incredible. Uh, is the IT department, all, all of them are incredible. So if I, I leave one of my groups out, uh, just know that you're all incredible. But you know, our, our boating and fishing access areas, which is unbelievable through his leadership. Um, our game lands, 2.2 million acres of game lands across the state. Our forestry programs, you know, that is ever more important in habitat management and, and, and land management that we're doing. Um, 
and, and land acquisitions that we, we talked, we just finished hearing about, you know, this is, this is under Eric's leadership. And, you know, he, he always talks about the people doing the work, but he never talks about Eric's leadership. And, and Eric, Eric is, you know, he's driving the train. He's driving the train when it comes to these great, great work that these groups are doing across the state from the mountains to the coast. And, you know, so, so appreciated. Eric started his career with the state of North Carolina with corrections. And I didn't know much about, you know, his career with corrections until he got ready to retire. And I started hearing from these folks from corrections or, or seeing some of the gifts that they were giving him. And I was like, wow, he, he had quite a career in corrections too. And, and, you know, and he came over to the Wildlife Commission on April 1st, 2002, and, uh, and brought those relationships with him that we are still using today and utilizing today in our partnerships across the state. And, um, you know, lots of Eric's projects have been a result of the relationships that he built earlier in his career with other state agencies. But, you know, when I describe Eric, when I was sitting here thinking about this, you know, and what I would say, uh, you know, I, you know, things come up for me and things through conversations with, with the board here, you know, have, we've shared these same, same feelings, but, but Eric has a vision for progress. He, he has that you know, captured. And, and, you know, a lot of the places that we are today, where we are today is because of Eric's vision for progress. Uh, he, he's so task oriented. He's a get it done kind of guy. Commissioner Stone said that last week, not even prompted by me at all. He said that. And he is. Eric is a get it done kind of guy. He's um, he's 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 such a dedicated teammate. You know, we're, as as our team here in the Wildlife Commission, Eric Eric just doesn't stick with his focus in his work unit. He's dedicated to the team, no matter what the team is. He's dedicated to the team. He's his professionalism is, is incredible. His character, his integrity. He's a friend, and he better than anything, he's a family man. Um. Eric, Eric he's, he's a tremendous asset to me. He's a tremendous asset to his team. And, you know, he, he's more, more than ever, he's, he's a tremendous asset, asset to North Carolinians across the state. Um, let me get to my other page. I'm actually presenting two things to Eric today. So, so that, that, that's going to be, you know, that's Eric's retirement plan that we typically give to, to our employees when they retire. But also, what we did, we did uh, seek out another award for Eric, and, and it's the Order of the Longleaf Pine. Uh, among the honors and awards the governor in North Carolina can bestow, none is more valued than the Order of the Longleaf Pine. Since its creation in 1963, it has been presented to honor persons who have a proven record of service to the state of North Carolina. Persons receiving the, the, long, the Order of the Longleaf Pine with the rank of Ambassador Extraordinary are privileged to enjoy all rights granted to members of this exalted order, among which is a special privilege to propose the following North Carolina toast to select company anywhere in the free world. Here's to the land of the Longleaf Pine, the summer land where the sun does shine, where the wheat grows strong and the strong grow great. Here's to down home, the old North State. Eric, you're very deserving of this award your uh this prestigious award and and at this at this moment now i'd like to turn it over we've got a special guest that would also like to say a few things on eric's behalf former director is that executive director gordon meyer <laughs> okay good morning y'all yeah. see me hear me yes sir. Yeah. yes sir okay good morning everybody good morning good morning well, first, um, thank you, Chairman Crump and Executive Director Ingham from, for allowing me to share in, in this very special presentation and to share some of my observations over Eric's career. You know, I spent a lot of time working with Eric, and, and I will say unequivocally that um, his contributions to the state of North Carolina throughout his professional career, not just at the Wildlife Commission, but also at the Department of Corrections, um, absolutely align in every aspect with the underlying principles of the Order of the Longleaf Pine. So what a, what a perfect honor for Eric. And, and if, you, if, I, if you may indulge me just for a few minutes, I've, I've written down some observations of sort of the chronology of accomplishments. And Cam, you did a wonderful job kind of covering those things, but so I've, please excuse me for any redundancy, but 
you know, I had the privilege to, to work alongside of Eric for on a daily basis um, for nearly two decades, starting in April 2002. And, and until my retirement last year, we literally spoke every day. And our relationship was always from day one, one of teammates working together and always working together to achieve the common purpose of what we had in front of us. And we worked hard and we had a lot of fun together too. Um, Eric was initially hired to support the commission's capital projects program. And so I had the opportunity to work with him to implement the commission's vision on preserving and developing the agency's infrastructure. And, and while there were general procedures on how we were supposed to go about doing that, it was a new program to us. And there were no playbooks on how to interact with a, a lot of different parties. And it was truly a learn as you go situation. And it was immediately apparent that Eric's adept leadership skills were, were just really strong. His smart uh, negotiation skills with architects, engineers, university administrators, contractors, and, and agency staff, they were always productive. And he always negotiated with strength and savvy, but he always reflected fairness to everybody involved. His, his ability to reflect conflict, I mean, to resolve conflict and solve problems was instrumental to us achieving the successes that we did. His competence, his hard work, his efficiency ultimately led to a de decision to place our entire capital improvement program under his leadership. And over the course of the following decade, the commission greatly accelerated its investments in infrastructure and continued its focus on repair and renovation of, um, and development of new facilities. And Eric, of course, was the key factor for the success in that program. But within that same time frame, just to give you some context, Eric's scope of responsibility was also expanded greatly. Ultimately, as Cam said, all agency infrastructure was placed under Eric. That's all of our buildings, all the commission's infrastructure, IT infrastructure, warehousing, boating and fishing access areas, game lands, forestry operations, land acquisition, safety, um, employee health and safety, all of that was organizationally aligned under Eric. He was even in charge of the Wildlife Magazine for a while, and also, as Cam mentioned, a, in, responsible for agency financial services. And he, he clearly and recognized and respected the importance and value of every member of his team. And as a manager, he actively listened to all of his team, provided the tools necessary for them to succeed. And under his leadership, by example, he truly led by example and leads by example, um, his accountability, his quick wit, and his positive outlook also fostered an environment of trust and support and accountability. And I, I will tell you that I have personally and professionally improved myself tremendously just through my interactions with him over the years. Um, Eric has led various teams to achieve a lot of accomplishments. I just want to name a few of the, just a few of those accomplishments. Um, the first lead rated state government office building, multiple public education centers, a statewide distribution of staff depot buildings. Um, we had a dilapidated system of depots across the state and Eric one by one had, had saw to it that those depots were renovated or new ones were built. A rehabilitation of multiple high hazard dams, management of our agency's wildlife habitats and associated infrastructure, retrofitted statewide public access that removes barriers for disabilities. Um, one of the top boating and fishing access programs in the nation, gaining national recognition many times. One of the top public shooting range programs in the nation, also built on a foundation of really creative partnerships that reflect his open-minded approach to achieving shared visions. Um, he and his capital projects team also worked closely with our fishery staff to, to safeguard the commission's vital fish hatchery system. Um, and despite all that workload, he conceived, initiated, and then implemented a creative and innovative pro program partnership at Dan River Prison Work Farm in Yanceyville, our wildlife inmate services program, which many of you all are aware, with, aware of. It's a tremendous program. And he did that basically on the side, I would say, because he had a full plate, as you know. In addition to all the other bricks and mortar improvements, Eric also was responsible for leading various teams to develop long range forecasting models for buildings, for capital infrastructure, information technology, timber management, and associated revenue, and I can go on and on. And I, I, it's, you know, that's not a complete list, but it certainly gives you a sense of all the valuable contributions to the state. And quite literally, I can say millions of North Carolinians' lives have been positively impacted 
by Eric's work and his leadership. His leadership is grounded in strong work ethics. It epitomizes the best in public trust management. And so Eric, congratulations, my friend. I love you like a brother. Thank you, Director Meyer. And at this time, I'd like for Eric to come up and, and let me present him the award. And Eric, if you want to make any comments, you're welcome to. If not, I will turn it back over to Monty Crump and, and let the board make comments if they please. I'll make a few comments. <laughs> I'll make it brief. I know everybody likes to get home. Um, well, two things. I had to pay a lot of money for Cam and Gordon to stand up here and say all those <laughs> wonderful things and make all that stuff up. Second thing I like to say is I don't know who got my wife out of work, but they deserve an award for that because that's the hardest working woman right there I've ever met. So they, they deserve an award. Um, and I think one one thing that, that Cam touched on is the teamwork part of it. And that that's true. All those things that you heard, there's not possible for one person to do that. It takes... It takes a whole team and my folks that have worked for me have made me look good for a very long time. And uh, they're the ones with the boots on the ground doing doing a lot of that work. And I couldn't the agency couldn't have accomplished that without the work that they did. So, you know, y'all are here today. I appreciate everything y'all have done for me and the folks in the field over the years that that I've worked for. Um, you know, I've always felt trusted and supported from the folks that, that work for me and from the top down too, which is real important. I think the board has always had trust in staff, uh, not just me, but at, but everybody They put the trust in staff and they're, they support them. And I think that's why this agency is probably one of the better, you know, the best agency in the state. So I appreciate the chairman and the commissioners, all y'all support over all the years. Um, and uh, Cam and Gordon, Gordon, I, didn't didn't realize you were going to be here today. I appreciate all those nice words you said about me. I'll give you a call later. But uh, uh, just thank you, and I'm honored for for all the nice words and uh, the award and all that stuff. So thank you, thank you so much. I appreciate everything. It's been a it's been a wonderful career. I can't think of a better agency to work for. Honestly, it's been a it's been a dream job. So many people say, "Oh, you got a dream job." Well, they're they're right. This is a a dream agency to work for and a dream job. I've, Really enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to spending some more time with my family now. I know they are too. Um, one of the first things Cam said when they walked in is, man, they didn't get any of your looks. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. <laughs> but anyways, thank you everyone. I, I appreciate it. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, before I turn it over to comments and any of the commissioners want to say anything, I've worked with Eric Long before I ever came to the commission on one of those projects out in our community. There was a partnership that has paid dividends for not only our community, the wildlife commission. So I can attest as being a customer long before I came in this building, how effective Eric is at building partnerships in relationships with local communities. And I can't add anything to the other than echo the accolades that have already been given other than I can't tell you how many times I've ended a conversation with Eric, either in an email or a text or in person and say, you're the man. I mean, and to me as a man, that's about as good a compliment as you can give to somebody. You are the man. And that's, I'll leave that. And you've heard me say it many times. Uh, and so I'll turn that over to any other comments at any commissioners. I, I'd, I'd like to make one quick, as most of you know, I've been here a long time and I've watched, not only Eric, but a lot of people evolve and, and assist the agency as they've, if they've matured and, and the agency has matured. And one thing they'll always say about Eric, when in some of the discussions we made either at this table or independently in the other meetings or trying to figure out how we can resolve a problem, Eric always came up. And in, in most cases, he was involved in that solution. And I will say <clears> that uh, my experience is, and a perfect one that a lot of us remember is when the magazine was in a jam. That's probably one that's just the easiest to remember right off the top. Um, Eric probably didn't know a damn thing about magazines, but he had enough, but he knew structurally what it was going to take to get it, get it squared away, get it back on track. 
So it went him, and he absolutely accomplished that as he has everything else in his career. There's no question he's been one of the driving factors in the success of this entire agency. And I think from the board, all of us, especially been here for a while, appreciate everything that you've done and accomplished and moved the entire agency and really made us all look good. So we appreciate that. Thank you. Any other commissioners? Um, Mr. Stone. Brian McRae. <laughs> when we were at the Caswell game, Lynn, I said something to you. And when I was driving home, I said, you know, that didn't come out right. Um, sometimes I say things that are a little rude and figure it out later. <laughs> <laughs> Not <laughs> cute. <laughs> no kidding, John. <laughs> but do you remember what I said about here? I remember what I said. <laughs> what, 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 what do you remember? That he's always been your favorite. <laughs> so I, I did kind of say that to hopefully motivate you to become my favorite. <laughs> 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 uh, but that is absolutely, I mean, you will be greatly missed, as everybody said. Well, there, there is great staff, and y'all are in good, good hands. There are some really wonderful people. I've worked my whole career around people smarter than me, and I've enjoyed every minute of it because <laughs> it's been a learning experience the whole the whole entire time. And uh, you're you're in really good hands with these folks for sure. Any other commissioners for comments, Commissioner? For well, those for those of you that had heard, Eric is an incredible public speaker. I've had the privilege of hearing that several times. Second of all, Gordon mentioned Eric's positive attitude. I can't, I know everybody knows Eric knows that too. Never seen him when he wasn't smiling. Never seen him when he wasn't happy. I've never asked him to do anything for me that he didn't meet or exceed my hopes and expectations. That's, that's the most I can do for him, Mike. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Any more comments from commissioners? I just have a quick one. Hey, and I ahead, haven't been here that long, but uh, this sort of piggybacks on what Tommy said. I remember my first day walking in this building and I wasn't exactly made as cocky as I sometimes see now that I've gotten a little comfortable next to him. But uh, <laughs> the first person that I saw and he was at the end of the hallway was Eric with that really bright smile. And it just eased my, uh, my worries considerably. And since then it was easy to work with you. And I know you were tasked with the lodge, which sometimes we, I roll a little bit about that, but you, you, you did a great job That's of a getting that building yeah. to a point where we can comfortably present it maybe in another way. So thanks for helping us so much with thanks. that. Thank you from High County. Thank you. Commissioner Hole. I just wanted to add, his wife actually came to make sure he did in fact retire because <laughs> she's got quite a list of things for him to do from what I understand. And um, oh yeah, <laughs> they, I, absolutely. <laughs> And listen, you're pretty strong because I tried really hard to get him to change his mind. So you won in that one, and uh, and and I hope you keep him on the straight and narrow. I will. I will. I know for sure he's going to miss all of you guys. I feel like I've been a part of all of you guys' lives for the past 20 years. He loves this agency, yes. and he is heartbroken. Uh, at the same time, very happy that we're going to spend more time with the girls. That's, that's perfect. Yes. Those are the bits for us. I don't know when. I'm hoping. <laughs> <laughs> Starting Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. Thank you for everything you have done with him and his career. And, and uh, we love all of you guys very much. Anything else? You know, the commissioners? You have more business, Mr. Executive Director? No, sir. Meeting adjourned.